It's done. It's finished. 2017 is over. Go, go call someone you care about and tell them it's going to be all right. As 2018 gears up and I'm catching up with writing the correct freaking year on my checks, I'm also going to be catching up with games from last year I missed. Because good stuff just kept coming out faster than I could play it. Last year's release lineup was churning out good games amid scandalous news stories that had 2017 working fast. I guess time flies when you're living in interesting times, and if there wasn't one new weird news story to look forward to every week, there was at least one good game to play through every month. I think it's important to note that we're almost five years into the PS4's life cycle, and Japanese games have been made great again, with most of the usual Game of the Year lists sporting more of Glorious Nippon than I've seen outside of Glorious Nippon. It's hard to remember, but this kind of renaissance was preceded by Phil Fish's infamous I suck comment in 2011 that actually mirrored the opinion of many established Japanese developers themselves. KJ Inafune in 2008 saw these long hard times coming, remarking with his pearl of infallible remarking, Japan is over, we're done, our game industry is finished. These sentiments were echoed by the president slash CEO of Platinum Games in 2011, saying, The current game business is struggling. Fresh surprises are becoming few and far between, especially in our home of Japan. This came years after the PS3's infamously difficult dev environment was giving everyone everywhere trouble while the console leading the hardcore market was the Xbox 360, which barely had a foothold in Japan. Mobiles and pachinko machines were scooping up both console gaming's audience and their developers. Sony was championing their cell architecture during the first three years of the PS3, and then they got quiet about it. Switching to x86 for the PS4 coincided with them coming out on top this generation, so back in 2013 when the thing originally started selling well, developers of hardcore Japanese games once again had access to a huge audience on a fast-selling hardcore Japanese console. So great Japanese hardcore console games could get greenlit again to come out four years or so later. The last generation was a decade-long struggle against diminishing creative risks and lengthening development hells, one of which finally ended with the release of Final Fantasy XV last year, and since then there's there's been a monsoon of quality Japanese titles. But don't think this is because of the PS4's success in Japan, where PlayStations are actually selling poorer than usual because, uh, you know, portables. So those of us elsewhere in the world are back to having hardcore Japanese games try to strike a worldwide appeal. So you saw them tackle more accessible control schemes and genres that have traditionally been more Western. Resident Evil is an FPS now, Zelda is an open world sandbox now, and even a couple levels in the new Mario kind of play like that too. Meanwhile, Yakuza 0 and Persona managed to release rave review installments without having to reinvent their wheel. So you got something for everybody. Japan's desire for high-end console gaming to peacefully coexist with mobile gaming is evoked nowhere stronger than in Nintendo's strategy. The Switch has blurred the line between the two, and whether or not it's the appealing concept of the console or its stellar marketing making the thing sell so well is a, uh, that's a fun debate. I'm a statistic in there somewhere. I bought a Wii U for Bayonetta 2 and it turned into a Smash Brothers machine. After they announced Bayonetta 3, I went out and bought a Switch and it became a Stardew Valley machine? Nintendo's consoles are traditionally a haven for their own first-party exclusives, but they've been striking a lot of deals with indie devs lately, and now it's kind of transformed into what is actually oftentimes a superior way to play a lot of what was formerly tethered to the PC. And I say superior because the portability of the Switch really mitigates the samey 30-minute loops of many games. Stardew Valley has the kind of explicitly repetitive cycle that would drive me nuts if I turned the lights off, shut off my phone, and concentrated on just it for a few hours. I tried it on PC a year ago, couldn't get hooked, but here on Switch I'm playing it all the damn time in cars, on trains, while trying to get to sleep in bed, while slouching my arms in whatever stupid position they want to get comfy in. It's great. On my former budget, I don't know if it'd be worth the $300, but it's still been a great indie games machine. Nintendo's gone through their own hubris to humility transformation, not unlike PlayStation, and this past year saw them change their background wallpaper from the cold elitist Apple White to a fun Lego Red. The Wii U might have had fun stitched into every one of its squares, but normal people didn't know that. The marketing behind the Switch is what's so fun about it. Just look at how much fun they must have had making this. Just look at how energetic and musical Mario's marketing has been. This game's levels are stages of music makers that sync up the player's interactions with music in a way so playful and pure and innocent that I've only seen this sort of stuff in obscure indie walking simulators everyone always gripes about. And the last Mario game. Hey, guess what? Speaking of which, Night in the Woods does the whole sound effects as music thing too. 
So when I think back on 2017, I'm gonna think back on music. Music, music, musical themes that aren't just great to listen to, but musical themes that aren't just honest, humble, fun, well-made music, but music that's playfully engineered with gameplay in mind in ways that you don't see often. 2017 had game music that's synced up to character animations and sound effects, or specific player-driven moments of meditative reflection. It's Mario in particular that I find most impressive. This is the next step up from just syncing in combat and peaceful music in and out. It's syncing up individual button presses and player movement speed to the music. So I know I've been really positive on these games, but honestly, when thinking back on the 2017 games I did play this year, there were many good ones, but I don't know if there were any gobsmacking excellent ones that appealed to my specific taste as hard as like The Witcher 3 did in 2015. I know, I need to play Prey. But I do think a lot of the background music I've heard this year could have been contenders for some of the best video game music ever. Composers are having way more fun with this than usual. Hell, even Prey is supposed to have some rad Neo 80s cyberpunk synth tunes in this gory, dark space horror. Next year's Music and Games Festival is going to be rad as heck if they can get people like Cuphead's Chris Madigan or Sonic Mania's T. Lopez over there for a concert. Mm, which, speaking of Sonic Mania, that happened. Sega handed the reins for a 2D spin-off game over to the fans, and that is such a smart strategy. I can't believe it took this long to try it out. Fans are fanatical about a franchise by definition. They're less susceptible to franchise burnout compared to the original devs, and they have a better understanding of what it's like to grow up and grow old with these franchises as a consumer rather than as a creator. It's evident that for someone my age, the creators of Sonic Mania have a way better understanding of what's cool about Sonic than Sonic Team themselves do. And greenlighting cheaper retro spin-off pitches, that is, real ones with the actual IP and a decent budget in the hands of proven developers, like Sonic Mania, would be great to see for other decades-long endless franchises too. But who'd have thought that the next big five-year trend in AAA games would be creating more systems-driven experiences rather than story-driven? This year, Zelda had the Endless franchise taking a turn towards the Endless Sandbox territory, and that's not really my jam right now. Meanwhile, I heard a term to refer to this trend that AAA multiplayer games are taking. Lifestyle games, like Destiny 2. Games with enough of a compelling loop and constantly updated content to become a daily part of someone's lifestyle, hooked into their lifestyle's budget via upsells sold through microtransactions and season passes. The silver lining is that that stuff also kind of reached a boiling point this year. If you're not a fan of corporate greed, 2017 was still fun since you finally got to see it bite EA in the ass. These practices are being legally questioned, and that's a real unsavory picture to be painting to the general public. Battlefront 2 bombed in reviews, but it didn't exactly bomb in the marketplace. But its loot box scandal is still being claimed to have a clear hit on its revenue, one analyst estimating they lost out on sales of about 3 million copies because of it. Each year, we come closer to the point where consumer outrage towards these practices finally breaks out of the core gaming bubble into the mainstream. And watching politicians in suits and concerned parents and angry pastors be mad about pay-to-win mechanics in hardcore video games was, uh, that was, that was something else. Making loot boxes become illegal may not exactly be the end goal here, but the thought of them being borderline illegal was generating enough negative PR to have some kind of rethinking of the concept go on. EA temporarily flipped the switch off for both this year's Star Wars and Need for Speed, then publicly announced that their bottom line doesn't depend on them anyway. And I relished in the chaos of it all. And though Call of Duty World War II was still the number one selling game this year, it was easy enough to avoid dwelling on those games because a lot of smaller, higher quality releases were spread throughout the year. Indie developers willing to kill themselves to make their dream game come true aren't beholden to the holiday shopping rush of physical stores. So the winter game drought is feeling more and more like a thing of the past. The bigger companies are catching on too. The first snow days of 2017 saw the releases of Resident Evil 7, Neo, Yakuza 0, Hollow Knight. In spring, we had Zelda, Nier Automata, Prey. As summer was coming in, Nintendo delayed what is going to be an inevitably unpopular pay-to-play online service, which meant Splatoon 2 released without any price-gouging controversies plaguing the other online shooters. Meanwhile, Ninja Theory figured out how to make fancy graphics happen without needing a publisher. Divinity Original Sin got a sequel with very, very high scores, and, uh... Star Fox 2 came out? Metroid 2 came out? In fall, you could play a fan-made remake of Metroid 2... Please hire these people! ...before an official remake of Metroid 2. The Switch got its second rave-reviewed killer app before the usual Call of Duty, Assassin's Creed, Winter Rush, Holiday Season, yada yada. But between all those big names, there were a lot of underdogs with soul. 
And that's what I spent most of this year playing. Even the 8 out of 10s this year were real good for some reason. Edith Finch, Sexy Brutale, A Hat in Time, and especially Pyre were just these explosions of talent that were making slick, polished executions on novel ideas. And last but not least, the final bit of Small Fry releases that actually made my year were perfectly acceptable PC ports of Vanquish and Bayonetta. Hell, it's about time. But what's the one, the game of 2017, the emblematic experience that evokes the atmosphere of the whole year? Well, the best game I played this year was totally linked between worlds, but the best game I played of this year was... Near Automata. A controversial game I have a controversial opinion on, but that doesn't mean I didn't have a blast going through the B-run and onwards. Few games get me as navel-gazy as this one. Seriously, my review of it is a piece of gush. Automata is far from perfect. It suffers from this unnecessarily barren open world that so many games suffer from these days. And dividing the story up between so many false endings that don't really end anything is, uh, something that I think is turning off more players than it's turning on, but that's kind of all part of the awkward quirkiness of it all. The good and the bad are all plugged into this beautifully personal exploration of beautifully human sci-fi thought experiments. It's a weeb trash version of Waiting for Godot, full of characters freaking out over their existential crises and their haphazard philosophical references in the most surreal ways possible, while of course a riveting soundtrack is cycling robot vocals and machine noises in and out of rooms depending on what the bad guys are supposed to be shouting. It's an experience, but the real reason I have it up here on this spot is because it evokes a kind of nostalgia that's really near and dear to my heart. And it's the kind of nostalgia that Platinum banks on in the same way Shovel Knight banks on NES nostalgia. Platinum games, including Nier Automata, get me feeling PS2 nostalgia. When the most popular console in history could only put out just enough of a graphics budget to get low-poly 3D smoothly looking like what the hell it's supposed to represent. When Japanese developers were small and numerous, and their budget and scope were manageable, stuff like Metal Gear Solid 2, Shadow of the Colossus, and Katamari Damachi showed that somehow in that era, big Japanese publishers were willing to put out bold passion projects. It's been over a decade since then. A lot of Japanese studios have merged or folded, and Automata was a real struggle to greenlight. It's a well-publicized story. During pitching, everyone thought it was pretty much guaranteed not to turn a profit. Yoko Taro relied on a friend to put in good words for him. Yet somehow they made a well-reviewed game on budget, with only one small delay. Taro says he just spent most of the time drinking while watching Platinum do their magic, all because the Square Enix producer he was friends with was tired of making Dragon Quest games. All of that is why Nier Automata reminds me so much of what my favorite games were when I was growing up. They were Japanese passion projects, put out by big publishers that gave them big production values. The stability to be able to throw around that kind of money now is likely the result of this renaissance in hardcore Japanese gaming. When I was playing through Automata, I was having flashbacks to renting quiet, thoughtful PS2 Japanese action games like Ico and Silent Hill 2, games that didn't pander to a mainstream audience despite having very high production values. And with Japanese corporate culture being as low risk as it is, seeing these bigwigs market the game so hard was all sorts of warm and fuzzy. Near Automata might not have been the best game of 2017, but 2017 was the year of a Japanese gaming renaissance and I feel Nier Automata best represents the fruits of that trend. That's why it's my game of the year. Long, long in the future, when I'll be thinking back on what craziness we're going through these days, I bet this weird, goopy, close-up shot of Adam's Barbie doll crotch is gonna be among the first things I remember about 2017 in gaming. 